welcome age of vintage society. You don't have to be macho to make heads turn in the cinema. The subtle, snobbish rebel Clifton Webb proved this. The man brought a kind of dynamics to Hollywood, and his impeccable dress burned him into the minds of his audience. Could Clifton Webb have been homosexual? As you all know how much I appreciate you, my viewers, so I want to thank you for your generous comments and for the Patreons. This video would not have been possible without you, and thanks to those who watched the video right to the end. Clifton Webb, the Eternal Bachelor In the past, and even in some parts today, men were to act in a certain way. They have to be brimming with testosterone and a dripping machismo. Hollywood leading men were usually brash and rugged. That sold movies, and the audience lapped those depictions of men up. Despite these odds against him, everyone at the time became caught in Clifton's web. Not only were people entrapped in his mesmerising performances, but they also began to dress like the man. This dandy of a man completely and utterly dominated the audience's minds with his impeccable dress sense. He was a refreshing difference from the hardy men and prided himself in looking good. Everyone wanted to wear a double-breasted vest, white mess coat dinner jackets, and a red carnation in the lapel. The red carnation, we suspect, was to celebrate the life of his mother, who was a constant presence in his life up until her death. Clifton was a rebel, a giant middle finger to established norms that existed in the society and spread by the media, but he did it ever so subtly. The man took on the role of a male babysitter, Lynn Belvedere, in the film Sitting Pretty, and became famous for his splendid acting in that film. The audience laughed their hearts out when he dumped a bowl of oatmeal on one of his charges' heads. Not only the moviegoers enjoyed his performance, critics also did too, and they were generous in their praises of him in their reviews. In his review, a critic of New York Times, Bosley Crowther, wrote, Yet there slyly protrudes through his arrogance a flickering spoof of pomposity and a tentative benevolence toward humanity, of which he generously agrees to be one. A student of the fine shades of kidding will find a lot to admire in Mr. Webb. Seeing the first movie's success, the studio churned out three additional titles, all headlined by the pompous Belvedere. Webb, of course, delivered in all of these films. After all, the films mirrored the real-life persona of this incredibly stylish actor. For some people, the Belvedere films were just more than a comedy. The first film followed a regular suburban family with parents that have become burdened by their societal apportioned roles that they can't parent their children properly. It was an effeminate man who defied social standards to do a work regarded as that of a female that brought order into the house. Usually people associate authority with manly men, but the stylish-looking Belvedere achieved the same without rippling muscles. However, sitting pretty successfully hampered Webb's already unflattering Hollywood career, even though it got him his last and final Oscar nomination. It further typecast the beloved actor as the snobbish dandy. Apparently he too was caught in his web. So regarding acting range, the screen didn't see much diversity in Webb's acting chops. Still, each of his snobby roles gave the audience the entertainment they craved. Sitting Pretty also brought Webb a scandal, but the scandal only involved the character he played in the film. Lynn Belvedere was rumoured to be having an affair with his boss's wife. Of course, it wasn't true, but as it is in real life, so it was in the movie. The controversy generated from that falsehood was home-wrecking, but the neatly dressed actor overcame it. In his off-screen life, Webb didn't generate any controversy. In a period in Hollywood where scandals were being passed around, actors and actresses alike, Webb remained squeaky clean, despite his mannerisms screaming homosexual. He had even admitted it on the film set when a director challenged his sexuality. In response, he claimed to be a devout homosexual, but nothing concrete came out of the admission. He wasn't caught balls deep in another actor or anything. Nothing newsworthy. You can only imagine the frustrations of the news houses of the period, but could Clifton have been homosexual? No one truly knows. The man had an immense level of privacy, which someone as popular as he couldn't have. Nothing leaked out of his household, consisting of only him and his mother. Honestly, the best way to describe the man would be asexual, as the one person he truly loved was his mother. 
Those two had a connection that was also spiritual. Interestingly, his roles in films had him acting as a family man. Homosexual or asexual, one thing wasn't uncertain about the snobbish dandy, talent. He had an enormous amount of talent. While his Hollywood acting range is limited, the things he had done before becoming a Hollywood man showed how the industry mismanaged his enormous talent. Webb had people entangled till he died. Perhaps few events in Hollywood are as tragic as the death of the delightful actor. We'd like you in on a closely guarded secret. Some spooky things happened right after he died. We are talking about Ghostbusters' level of spookiness. Yep, there was some ghost hunting involved too. Webb and his mother, Maybelle, were inseparable up until the time she died in 1960. The two lived together and she was his little Webb even when he was old enough to have his own grandchildren. His relationship with his mother wasn't just love, it was a devotion that even some religious people cannot muster. So when she died, Clifton died too, but not immediately. He had a slow, anguish-filled existence followed by death. After his mother's death, Clifton mourned and continued to do so for a few months. One of his close friends cowered, bravely and maybe harshly lamented about Clifton's inability to move on, seeing that his mother lived a full life. She died at ninety when he was seventy-one. This seems excessive and overindulgent, Coward noted. In anger, he also noted, it must be tough to be orphaned at seventy-one. Clifton wasn't moved by his friend's statement. He missed his dear old mum, whom Coward claimed drove the delightful dandy actor mad for years. The obsession over his mother's death took a spooky turn. He began to see her around the house, and was so sure that it was her presence he was seeing. So he turned to the occult to make contact with his mother. He brought psychics to the house, and they organised multiple seances to blur the lines between life and death to make contact with the dead. He got his wish and was able to meet his dead mum. How? He died. Shortly after his mother's demise, Clifton's health began to fail, and it affected his performances. It would appear that he still has not gotten over his mother's death. Gradually, the health challenges began to pile up, so much so that he needed surgery to solve an abdominal issue. Webb had the surgery, and it was successful. Still, death hovered above him, and it came in the form of a heart attack. His place of death was his home in Beverly Hills, but he wasn't alone up to that time. His secretary, Helen Matthews, who had worked with him for twenty years, was there with him when death finally claimed him. He finally would have his rest and be with his one true love, Maybell. Or did he? Notable people came for his funeral, Catherine Hepburn, Tony Curtis, Janet Gaynor, Samuel Goldwyn and Sam Engel. The producer came. Sam Engel eulogised him, calling him a sociable yet luxurious person with a great work ethic and maintaining his integrity right to the end. But this is where it turns spooky. Some people began to see Clifton in the cemetery along with the ghost of other notable Hollywood stars. Visitors claimed to see eerie lights, hear whispers, and him whistling a tune, feel sudden cold, and smell Clifton's signature cologne when they were near his tomb. It's curious that other people, apart from his friends, knew what he smelled like. Some even said they saw his ghostly figure dapper in a stylish suit. Others said they saw an aura shaped like him. It didn't end there. There were claims that he haunted the Beverly Hills home. His statement that where he said, I'm not leaving this house, even at death, held a different meaning now. The house had a great significance to Webb. It was one of his first acquisitions when he had his big Hollywood break following a couple of high-profile films. He had his private classes in that house. It was his sanctuary, the place where his artistry could flow limitlessly. The house itself had a bit of a history too. It was built by Arthur Rosson, the silent film director in the 20s. Rosson's wife got it when they divorced, and after her marriage to Victor Fleming, she leased the house to stars. Notable among the stars who got the lease was Marlena Dietrich. Grace Moore, the opera star, also lived in the house. The house had always played host to people with boundless talents. Jean and Kathleen Lockhart buy the house, and soon after, their constant guest in that house, Clifton Webb, convinced them to sell it to him. So before Clifton settled into the house in 1947, 
He had spent much time there, so no wonder Douglas Kramer, the TV producer, and his Los Angeles gossip columnist wife, Joyce Haber, claimed to see his ghost in the house. Although we are a bit sceptical about their claims because, well, Joyce Haber ran a gossip media house, there were already rumours of ghostly sightings in the cemetery, and perhaps Joyce could have cooked up something she knew would bring publicity for her media house. Maybe her husband was in on it too. Who knows? The two claimed any time they were enjoying drinks by the pool they would see a shadow that bore Clifton's physical shape drifting in the primary bedroom. Did they have too much to drink, maybe? So when Kramer said he only saw the shadow of the window and it was his wife, the owner of a gossip newspaper, that saw it up close, it's normal to want to doubt. Still, Kramer maintained he saw what he saw and that the shadow always resembled Clifton and he seemed to be ageless. Douglas Kramer also claimed that May Bell, Webb's mum, also had a presence in that house and he saw shadows that had her shape in the hallway. Kramer also reported that their dogs reacted to areas in the house that were unusually cold. It gets even spookier. One of the cold spots was outside the room Clifton's mother used. Apparently Clifton's ghost paced outside the room. Then it gets darker. Their maid began to get attacked by what was a cold presence. Joyce got one of Clifton's films and brought it home to confirm their suspicions. When they played the films, their dogs reacted to Webb on the screen and began to howl in recognizance. Scary, isn't it? Now came the occult part. Joyce thought it was a great idea to contact the presence in their home. They engaged the services of Sybil Leake, a psychic. She invited some of Webb's friends, and according to Douglas Kramer, they became convinced that truly Clifton's spirit never left the house. Sybil began to say stuff only Clifton would have known. When they asked why he still remained and wasn't resting, the Clifton ghost said, "'Because I'm afraid I'll be forgotten.' However, after the seance, little Webb and his mum stopped haunting the house and moved on. Eventually the house would be demolished. Still, how come mother and son were inseparable in life and in death? The answer lies in the dynamic of their relationship, which began when Clifton Webb, born Webb Parmalee Hollenbeck, on the 19th of November 1889 in Indianapolis. His birthplace has become lost in history, but at that time it was a hub, like most men at the time, his father was a blue-collar worker who worked as an assistant passenger manager for a railway company. His mum was the daughter of a railroad conductor who longed for the theatre but would never get what she desired. In another universe, the stylish actor could have been working at the railroads far flung from fame. However, his mother wouldn't let that happen. She was resolute in her decision that if she couldn't be in the theatre, her son would. The father, on the other hand, didn't look to be on board with the theatrical ambitions his wife had and sought to force on their son. So, when Webb was three, his mother left his father. The separation was so brutal that Clifton's father became non-existent to them. They didn't speak of him. The reason for this is so simple and bizarre. We never speak of him. He didn't care for the theatre. That was what Maybell said when asked about Webb's father. Even when the man died after retiring from his railroad job, the woman said nothing about him. In a way, that's cruel, but Webb can't be blamed for this. His mother was the architect of his life and imprinted so much in him. She took her son to New York and enrolled him in a dancing school which helped a children's theatre to notice him when he was seven. In 1900, Clifton was the only one to bring light to his mother's life, who had challenges at the time. That year he made his debut as a theatrical actor in the famed Carnegie Hall and featured in multiple stage movies. Acting wasn't the only thing he did on stage. He learned how to sing and paint, wowing the audience with his tenor voice. Singing became his artistic mainstay, debuting in Boston's Back Bay Opera House with his act in Mignon. Fortune smiled at him and his acts as he got to perform at New York's Liberty Theatre. His skill as a dancer led him to Broadway theatres, prominent among them being the Winter Garden. The man even snagged a $250 per week contract in his first major dance engagement as Bonnie Glass tapped him up to work with her. He worked with other great Broadway stars like Mae Murray and Jenny Dolly. Clifton didn't have his trajectory harmed by war as he was available to avoid being drafted for World War I by indicating he had a dependent who wouldn't fare well in his absence. 
So instead of going to war, his craft took him to more Broadway stages, overseas in London, and a couple of silent films. But his journey to Hollywood wasn't that smooth. The man was disappointed in his earlier attempts. He signed a life-changing $3,000 per week contract for a film about a dancer and wasted 18 months without ever shooting a film as the studio, MGM, had production issues. Broadway welcomed him back and he got a couple of leading man roles. When 20th Century Fox came, success followed as he excellently performed as the villainous Waldo Lidecker in Laura. The film earned him his first Oscar nomination and he got an extended deal as an actor with 20th Century Fox. His second nomination was also with the company for his performance in 1946's The Razor's Edge. When recognition came as other actors brought their spouses, Webb went with his mother. No one could place him in any relationship. For all his talent, commitment was something that was beyond him. So when his mother died, some of him died with her. These Hollywood stars have always had a secretive private life. Did Gary Cooper also have an intimate with men? Let's find out from this video.